We're on the rising side. If I could be up and about long, less than four hours of sleep, so can you. <laughs> Might be a little wacko by the end of the day, but we'll be all right. What's new? <laughs> What's new? <laughs> Praise God. I am so excited to be in the house of God. My wife came in. She said, yeah. she just stay in bed. I said, no, no, I won't. So we are glad to be here this morning. And I, I pray that you all come ready to, to lift praise to the King of Kings. Amen. You know, so often what the enemy uses against us is you see everybody else making ground. And you think, man, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Then you feel like you're distant. You feel like you're going further away. But let me tell you something this morning. I serve a big God. And he's got time for you. You get down on the floor and wrestle with you. He'll make an opportunity for you this morning. He'll get right in your business. And he'll make an opportunity for you to feel like you've got a father in heaven. Amen? Amen. I tell you this morning, I'm excited to serve Jesus. How about you kids? Yeah. Yeah. You excited to serve Jesus? Hold them heads high. Amen? I want you to know, we're just a few days from what most people would call the Devil's Day, October 31st, which is on a Sunday. We get to worship the King of Kings on the Devil's Day. Hello, and we'll turn it into the glorious harvest. Amen. But the day before, on the 30th, we're going to have a harvest party here. Amen. I'm sure there'll be hot dogs and hamburgers and s'mores and all kinds of good stuff going on that day. Amen. We're going to have a blast right here with family. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray this morning. Let's ask God to do something amazing. Will you go to war with me this morning in prayer? Come on, let's go to war this morning. Son of God, we need you this morning. We want your anointing in this house this morning. We want you to speak to us from heaven. We want the Holy Spirit to be welcome in this house this morning. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Have your way and move in the midst of us. Shake us. Break us. Mold us and make us this morning. And move on this house in such a way that we will know that you have been here. And let us go with you and change the lives around us this morning. But Father, now, as we stand here, we prepare to worship you and give you the glory and the honor you deserve this morning. Amen? We're going to give him the glory and the honor he deserves this morning. Amen? Amen. Come on! Give God some praise. Give him some shout. Give him glory this morning. He's a big God. He's a glorious God. Now you love him this morning. Let's worship. Amen? Amen.
sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. That means that my unconditional love is enough for you. Oh, Jesus, your grace. It's enough for me. Even when I feel like I don't deserve it, I receive it regardless because it's unconditional this morning. Oh, we love you, Lord. So remember us this morning. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough, oh heaven. Reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. Oh God, I sing your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. Do that again. Your grace is enough. Heaven reaches to us. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. God, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. It's Sweet the sun. 
amazing love now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree grace flows down and covers me it covers
hands in this moment. Jesus. to him. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace. That is greater than all us. Is. Yes, He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves. Yes. You love us, oh, how you love us, oh, how you love us, oh, how you God, you love us this morning. Oh, we wait in your presence today. Speak to our hearts this morning, Lord God. When I feel that I don't deserve it, it's still there. Your unconditional love is still there. It doesn't change. We love you, Jesus. Just bask 
covers me it covers me it covers me it covers sweet the sound amazing love now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree your grace flows down and covers
is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Thank God for that. Nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You can't, east and west don't meet. It's just a continuous, ongoing circle. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, and perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you host, who, you who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, all my soul. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. You know, when I first read that in the scriptures, I thought it meant it covered it up, like kind of hid it, you know what I mean? That's not what the word's teaching. But the word's teaching, when love covers a multitude of sins, it means there's always an open arm for the sinner to come home. And that when that sinner comes home, that calloused heart begins to be renewed and softened again. It means the open arms of Jesus is right there waiting. Waiting. Just waiting. Without judgment. See, here's, here's the thing we don't understand. The Bible says Jesus came into the world to not condemn it. We get John 3.16 right all the time, but we forget 17, we forget 18. But we're so quick. judgment. Part of us, I think it's just our natural self. I don't know. But I know it's not our spiritual self. <laughs> it's not our spiritual emotions. Why does people place judgment so quick? One, they're either hiding something secure or they're just playing games with God they're trying to look good in front of everybody else but where does a place of judgment come from a hard heart 
See, there's a difference between calling something out and calling it out and condemning it. If Jesus did not come in this world to condemn it, what right do we have? <laughs> we have no right. You think you're better than God? That's pretty arrogant. There's nobody worthy of this grace. That's why they call it grace. There's nobody worthy of his love. That's why his love is full of grace. We'll never me measure up. Never. But thank God for Jesus. He didn't just pay the consequences. He didn't just pave the way. He made it right for you and me. That's hard. And you know what's hard about that? It's hard to accept. Because what does our pride want to do? Our pride wants to earn what we cannot. Becoming better. Do you really think you can become better on your own? Mm -mm. If you could become better on your own, there was no need for Jesus. It's all about his grace. I don't know about you this morning, but I love the fact that I can't earn it. Because I'm pretty pretty much a screw up a lot of times. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many times I've got, I got to run to him and just cry out for his grace. But you know what? He doesn't get sick of it. He don't. You know, there's some people who think, oh, well, grace of God, love of God, you bunch of softies. You know what? You're right. I am a softie when it comes to Jesus. That's why I don't live like I used to live and think the way I used to think. We go back to our old ways because we're no longer softies with Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> something to think about. Yeah, I'm a softie for Jesus. It's kind of like I'm a softie for my kids. You know that, kids? Adults don't get me crying very much, but y'all can probably get me more like that. <laughs> I got a soft spot for kids. Sorry. Maybe sorry, maybe not sorry. Right? You know, Jesus got a soft spot for you, too. He does. He's got a soft spot for you, too. Father, I thank you this morning. for your grace. I thank you for your overwhelming love in our life. I thank you that we cannot earn it. Even though we try, we just look a fool. We're just being arrogant and proud. But Lord, even in that, you still teach us by your grace. You lead us by your grace. Father, anybody that's here this morning that's not gotten their life with you, maybe they've allowed their heart to become calloused and hard. Maybe they're yet to become a softy for you. Father, I pray this morning that your spirit deal with them the deepest of ways.
Father, we have a responsibility with grace. Because grace teaches us an appreciation to not go back to the old ways, to not do it again, to, to not continue to live and to think and to be the person that we know you don't want us to be. But grace teaches us, come on, I got you by the hand. I'm on this journey with you. Sometimes we feel so unworthy, but Lord, you made us worthy through Christ. And we thank you for that this morning. For you are one awesome God. Some pastors like to get the list before service. I hate getting the list because I don't want to know. I want the spirit to flow. That's right. She's like, I can give it to you. <laughs> God's speaking this morning. He's speaking loud and clear. Loud and clear. There's, there's somebody here this morning who's like, I gotta respond to this. And here's here's the thing. You know you need to respond to this, and inside you want to respond to this, but there's something so heavy inside of you that's keeping you sitting on your butt in the chair. I don't know what it is. Pride, maybe arrogance, maybe I don't know. Maybe unworthiness. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this: when God gets our attention and He flows and puts things together like that, He's got a word He's trying to speak to us. Something that He's trying to get to us. What's he trying to get to you this morning? What's he trying to get to you that you've been fighting against? What's he trying to get to you? Maybe there's some fear. It might sound a little weird, but maybe there's a little bit of a fear that's just kind of inside saying, well, I can't. I get prayed for, they're going to think I'm so far backslidden. We're going to think this or that. We don't think nothing. Something I want to make clear, we don't think nothing. There's no judgment. 
Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn it. Why would we judge anybody? Does that mean we allow just anything to go on? No, no, no. I think we have a mature idea of what that actually means. It's a safe place. If you're here this morning and you need to deal with something, I want to pray with you. Before we even go into word, I want to pray with you. Because I believe God this morning wants to just cover you and overwhelm you in that grace and give you an experience with him that you've never never had before. There's somebody in here and you're sitting there and you're squirmish. <laughs> Inside you're squirmish. Because you know it's you, Holy Spirit, pointing you out. Of course, your flesh is saying the preacher's just wanting to get in my business again. Plus, it's the devil lying to you. But you're squirmish. You know it's you. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss it. sitting here and you think, well, I always at the altar. Well, get it. It's the best place to be. <laughs> we should all be at the altar all the time. It's not why we do this, because we're just trying to get someone in the altar. We do this because we don't want to miss opportunity. But the Spirit's speaking. That doesn't mean we move on beyond be, beyond this. What I mean by that is any time you want to respond, you come up. I don't care if it's in the middle of me preaching. Don't miss what God wants to do this morning. Two kids were raised in the same home. Same experiences, same situation, everything. And I asked this individual, I said, well, why is it that your sibling has nothing to do with God, even though they've been raised in a Christian home? same situation, same everything. And even though you don't agree with some of the stuff in the church, 
you still don't turn your back on God. You still desire Him. And this is what this individual said to me. I'll never forget it. Because I had an experience with his love. It touched me. I experienced his love. My sibling, she knew it here. But all the times at youth camp, kids camps, and sitting in worship services and doing all this, she never responded to the opportunity. She never got the experience. That's heartbreaking. Because, you know, as a church community, one of the things that's inevitable that happens Everybody will sit under the same house for the same opportunity. But I guarantee somebody will not respond. They will sit there and sit there and sit there. Oh, they'll come. They'll show up. They'll be here. But they're not going to make it personal. And one day I can see them standing before the Father at Judgment Day. And just like those two siblings, the Father's going to ask them some questions. One, did you respond to the opportunity? We'll have to give account for that. That's something to think about. I don't know about you, but I don't want to that you know Father I thank you this morning for your grace and your love and Father you know this morning whose heart you're dealing with so deep Lord you know this morning exactly who needs to respond to the opportunity that you've set that you've laid before us Father, you know whose heart it is that, that needs to yield to you. And so, Father, I'm praying this morning, Father, even as we transition in your word and do, do all this and all that, God, I pray this morning, God, that you would move in the most powerful way upon that individual, whether they're responding here to the opportunity or on the way home, or God, even at home. But, Lord, that they not miss what it is you're trying to say. That they will not miss what you're trying to speak. But, Lord, that they would experience this for themselves. That it not become a head knowledge. That it not just become words. But, God, it become a way of thinking, a way of being, a way of living because of the experience of your grace in their life. Father, I thank you this morning. You've never turned your back on us and you never will. For it is by your grace. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We're going to let the kids go on the kids church and uh, the Lord blew the clouds away a little bit so y'all don't have to walk over in the rain this morning that's a good thing huh God's good, amen. That's right, God's power. For sure. It's one of these days I'm going to get me a dirty cravat that is skinny, could be put to the side and folded up and out of the way. So when I'm not using it, it's in the corner. 
but when I'm in using it, it's not doing all this mess. <laughs> um, yeah. So, bring me another stand. This will be the second one I've gone through. <laughs> <laughs> that is still working too well. Oh, praise God! Well, we're going to go to Joshua chapter one this morning. What am I doing here? Joshua chapter 1, and verse 13 is what I'm going to focus on this morning. This is a really good verse of scripture. We, I, I, I want to encourage you to be praying um, for our church body, as I know many of you all do. Just got a lot going on right now. People, people out, and sick, and just all kinds of different things going on. And um, just pray God to... Do what he does, right? And uh, I believe that he will. That is for sure. I'm going to talk to you about something this morning, and I'm sure you probably heard this chapter preached 101 times. If you've heard any sermons or you've been in church in any length of time. But there's a verse of scripture in here that I want to focus on this morning that um, we probably don't look at too much or maybe we overlook. Not intentionally, but we just kind of scan across it. Verse 13 in Joshua chapter 1, it says this, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest. <laughs> I'm glad he promises that. I just need to learn how to take him up on that, right? <laughs> listen, to, listen to the last part of this verse. And we'll give you the land. That doesn't even sound, how do you rest and God give you the land at the same time? How do you rest and get victory at the same time? How do you not fight? You know? Yeah, it's not a fight. How, how did this be, it, seems, it seems almost contradictory, don't it? Well, we're going to get into this this morning because I think a lot of times we are right here. And when it comes to spiritual warfare, when it comes to pressing in, when it comes to cleansing and getting our lives right, getting our thinking right, getting our emotions right, it is easy for us to want to do the work. And what happens when we do the work? We get exhausted, we get bitter, we get out of shape, uh, just we become a mess. And we become a mess because we try to do it within ourselves. And so we're going to talk about this this morning. Because I think a lot of times, and probably right now, you know, I was sitting in this morning, I was praying, and I was like, God, why? Is it? I feel like right now, our community is like in a transition. Some of us have walked through some really hard battles. Some of us have walked through them, and kind of like I was talking about last week, we've gotten to the other side, and, you know, we've, we've, we've got a decision to make of how we're going to handle this. You know, some of us have even asked the question, is, has this even been worth it? And, yeah, it's been worth it. And, but we're, 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 on this, we're on this other side, and it's like we're in this transition. And if we're not careful, We'll get complacent. You hear what I'm saying? We'll get, we'll get complacent. We'll just lay back and, well, God got me this far. Well, God's got me here now. And, w and we'll just get comfortable with it. And what we'll do is we'll stop pressing in. We'll stop pushing. We'll stop pressing. We'll stop being as committed to the things of God that we used to be. We'll, we'll start making excuses for things and we'll be doing like, oh, you know, 
getting complacent. And that is the worst thing you can possibly do. Because God did not bring you through the journey to the other side for you to sit on your butt and then get lazy and complacent. He brought you there to walk in victory to lead somebody else. And this morning, we're going to kind of talk about that. Father, I thank you this morning. For you are such a gracious God. You're so gracious, Lord. You have taken us through so many, many journeys in here. There are testimony after testimony after testimony of your greatness in so many ways. And Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you this morning, God, that we don't have to turn to the left or to the right. I thank you this morning, Father, we can keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And, Lord, I thank you that you have surrounded us with such a great cloud of witnesses like Moses and Abraham and Joshua and Nehemiah and Jesus. And, God, we can look to these and say, yep, that's the path. Yep, that's how that's how that battle gets won. Yep, that's how I need to think. So, Father, you've not left us orphaned, nor have you left us without instruction. God, you've given us both. You've given us Holy Spirit, and Father, you've given us your word. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So to kind of understand Joshua chapter 1, you've got to kind of go back to Deuteronomy 31. And in Deuteronomy 31, you know, we, we Deuteronomy, I call it the wandering book. Because what ends up happening in Deuteronomy is Moses, or Moses, Israel for 40 years, all they do is wander around in this little circle of about 120 miles in the desert, not wondering, not knowing where they're at, not knowing what they're walking through or going through, this constant circle. Could you imagine that? That'd be like almost to, oh, what is it, Manhattan, I guess, or something like that. Between here and Manhattan, and you got millions of people wandering around in this desert about the size of that for 40 years, and it seems like they're stuck and can't get out. That, to me, is nuts. But that's exactly what happened. Yeah, what a terrible choice. And God told Moses, because of Moses' sin, because the sin in leadership does affect the body, unfortunately. It, it does. And your sins does affect those that are around you. They, they do. Uh, it's very, not only is it selfish for you to sin, but it's selfish for you to think your sin doesn't affect other people because you don't have the right concept of what sin is, if that's the case. That's why sin is so deadly. But here we have this Israel walking around this desert all through the book of Deuteronomy, and God tells Moses, so, well, because of your sin and your sister's you know, bar barked out against Moses and, you know, the earth opened up and 3,000 people swallowed in the ground. I mean, it, Deuteronomy is kind of crazy. It's, I mean, it's some of the things God did. It's almost like, God, you're really mad at these people. <laughs> and God told Moses, he said, well, until you and your generation is gone, you're never going to the promised land. That, to me, is just, Wow kind of harsh but i thought what is even harsher in a way is is here moses before he dies he he brings god brings him up on this mountain and he said you see all that land out there that could have been yours but it's going to be your next generations it ain't going to be yours because you're going to you're going to be gone and you won't you won't be part of it but your kids and your kids kids and all them they will so joshua is the second generation, and Moses has been mentoring Joshua all through these 40-some-odd years in this desert. And I could imagine for 40-some-odd years in that desert, I'm sure Moses was telling Joshua, Joshua, I'm going to tell you now, God told me I'm not going to see the promised land, be part of the promised land, anything else, because of my sin, because of what I did. And I imagine Moses probably told Joshua that every day, all the time, reminding him the importance of getting it right with God 
aligning himself up with God and how it affects not just him personally, but it affects the whole entire nation. So we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses ends up passing away. And Joshua's kind of devastated. I mean, I would be too. You know, when your mentors start passing away, it, it's hard. And, you know, most of, I mean, I've got mentors that are in their 70s now, pushing 80s. And, you know, when I started with them, they were only in their 40s. It's different. You know, my spiritual mom, it's different. She's gone. She's been gone for about six to t about six years now, seven years. She's gone. It's hard. And so this is kind of what Moses and Joshua's relationship is, and this is the kind of the pain that Joshua is going through. And so you get into jo you get into Joshua chapter one, and and after Moses passes away, Joshua is left in the leadership of a nation that is broken, a people that are wore out, a people that is untrained, a people that is unfit for anything except for wandering around in circles. <laughs> they they're they're wore out. They're exhausted. And Joshua is supposed to lead these people into the promised land. Now, here's the thing that's interesting is God tells Joshua to lead these people into the promised land, but there are many enemies that are in the promised land. There are many things that are going on in that promised land that's not supposed to be there. And this morning, there are some things in your promised land that are going on that needs to be taken down and needs to be taken out. God's promised you the promised land. That's not the problem. The problem is, is we get complacent instead of keeping on pushing, and, and, and we cross the Jordan, and we think we made it. You haven't even started yet. You got the Philistines to deal with. You got Jericho to deal with. You got the Hittites, the Hivites, and all the Eites, and all Knights, and all that kind of crazy stuff that's laid up in your promised land, and it's time for you to take it down. God, God's called you to a promised land, promised you a promised land. We crossed that Jordan because we, oh, did you see the miracle of crossing that Jordan? Man, I must have arrived. He really did a miracle in this journey to get me to the other side. And we sit on the banks of the Jordan, looking back at what was, sitting in what is, and not going forward to what we need to be. That wasn't even in my sermon notes this morning. But, <laughs> but we can't do that. It's time to get our feet out of the water. It's time that we get back up and start marching. It's time we start asking God, what's the next journey? God, what's the next thing? God, where, where's, the, where's the next place you want me to go? What's the next battle? You mean you, need to, you mean you want me to ask God what the next battle is? That's right. If you want to go to the promised land, you got to clean out the nonsense. See, so, so we get about half the promise, and we think we're okay with that. Well, I don't know about you. I want the full promise. I don't want just half of it. I want all of it. Oh, you're getting greedy. <laughs> well, we can call it what you want. I want all of it. And I tell you what, if I beat you there, I'm sorry you left in dust because I ain't waiting. <laughs> I'm pushing on. I'm going on. I'm moving on. See, one of the things that I've learned, you know, in my walk with Christ personally, is that somehow or another, that when I stand at that Jordan, I get to that other side. And I, I know I'm going to take the promise. I know what promise it is I want. And I'll even go and God will do this miracle and open this door. 
I mean, I want you to think about this. How many people you know or you've seen or watched, God gives a healing, God gives a job, God does whatever, and then they quit showing up at church. They quit coming prayer meetings. They quit coming to Bible studies. They quit pressing in and doing the things they used to do. It's like God opens a door, gives them a miracle, and bam, they, you know, they're prospering and they're moving in a different direction. And it's like their whole world changes. Their priorities change. And what are they doing? They're sitting on the banks of the Jordan with their feet in the water, looking at what was, being okay with what is instead of going with what he really wants them to have. It's not the end of the story. But when I'm sitting on the banks of the Jordan in my own life and I got my feet in the water like that, you know what my mentors, the words of my mentors remind me all kinds of stuff. They don't have to call me. I get haunted by their words. And every mentor I've ever been around, they just use the good old-fashioned term. Pull your bootstraps up and get off your butt and get doing something. Don't sit. Don't sit. Oh, God gave me victory. It's time for me to rest. Wrong. Mm -mm. Wrong. You should have been resting the whole time you was getting the victory. That don't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense that I'm struggling with something and I'm emotionally beat up and I'm a mess. And I'm supposed to be resting while I'm walking through this journey? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, if I don't do the work, it'll never get done. Boy, I tell you what, I'm full of that kind of pride myself. Mm -hmm. Guilty me. But when it comes with our walk with Christ, we can't do it that way. We can't work it that way. We have to rely completely upon him. And here's, here's the interesting thing about Jesus. And, and, and I never quite understood this either, but, you know, it, it's just, you know, some people like to put Jesus as this pie in the sky. Everything's going to be okay because I got saved and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm sorry, but God did not promise you a pie in the sky and an easy life. Mm -mm. And... Yeah, exactly. In John 16, 33, Jesus said this way, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. Oh, oh, I like peace. Don't you like peace? Everything calm, quiet. I know quiet for some of y'all may not be peaceful, but for me it's very peaceful. It's calm, quiet, you know. But listen to what Jesus says here. <laughs> In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. Huh? You're telling me I'm going to have troubles and I'm supposed to take courage. Yep. I have overcome the world. Now, this, now this is echoing a verse that's in Joshua 1, 13. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commands you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest. What did Jesus just say? I'm giving you peace. And then, then, Mo, then the Lord tells Joshua, but go take the land. And Jesus is saying, you're going to have trouble. Man, okay, Lord, you just blew my mind. That don't even make sense to my carnal mind. Well, first of all, we have to get out of our carnal mind to understand the spiritual principle, right? Because <laughs> we can't understand it in ourselves. We'll go through life with this Bible never making sense to us if we try to understand it with this and without the leading of the Holy Spirit. We've got to get beyond this. Jesus never promised that pie in the sky. Sorry. Here's the thing that I love about the Lord, though, is that he always promises peace and rest through our troubles. He promises victory. That's his promise. His promise has conditions, though. You know that? Why isn't God coming through? Why ain't you abiding in him and him and his word? Well, I thought Jesus said he, he'd give me anything I ask. Well, yeah, when you delight yourself in him. 
There's conditions to his promises. We can't expect God just to show up like some genie in a little bottle or whatever you call it. We rub his little belly and hope something pops out of the bottle and it's good for me. That ain't how kingdom works. But, you know, we have, we have these smorgasbord ideas, I guess you could call it, where we just sit down at this, pick out what we want down the line and put it on our plate and just thank God for it later when Jesus is saying, get off the smorgasbord and sit at my table and receive what I want to get to you. I guarantee Jesus wants to give something and get something to you that you never even thought of. Guarantee it. But we'll never know about it when we got our feet dangling on the Jordan River, got our feet in the water. I'm okay. I'm on the other side. I'm safe now. Ha! Ah. Really? Because when Israel went and got into the promised land, I don't think people trying to kill you is called safe. I don't think people coming at you with swords and spears and all kinds of crazy, you know, just, I don't, I don't call Goliath this big giant safe. But I thought I was in the promised land. The promised land is dangerous. Because it requires a fight. It requires us taking some ground. Now, here's the interesting thing. Every time Israel stepped in to take ground, what ends up happening? The Lord comes through. You might ask yourself, why is God not coming through in these, in these areas of my life? Are you taking the steps? See, Jesus, Jesus, made, Jesus made it really simple. He said, if you love me, you obey my commands. We find out in the book of John. There's conditions. There's conditions. But here we have Joshua. I'm sure he's being taught these things from Moses, his mentor. He's being taught these things. And as he's being taught these things, he's, he, he loses his mentor and he's broken up. He's sad. He's looking at this group of people and he's like, Man, what a bunch of misfits. Man, we've done nothing but wandered around for 40 years in this desert. And it wasn't even our fault. And now God is telling us to do something we've never done before. We've never gone into battle. Maybe we battled over fish. But we didn't battle over anything else, you know. I mean, we really never went to battle. We really never had to really face anything. We just wandered around this desert for 40 years. That's all we've done. Circle around, circle around. Kind of like that circle back and, mm, oh, shut up. <laughs> some of you got it. Some of you. But we just circle around constantly. It's like they've done nothing. We have no experience. We don't know how to really pray. I mean, Moses kind of taught us. We saw Moses. We learned from him. But if God was mad at those that went before us, do we really want to follow in their footsteps? I mean, that kind of makes you think. I mean, I'm all about respecting my elders, but if, if my elders that I'm following or respecting got them nowhere in God, then I probably should find somebody else to follow. Because I want to get somewhere. I want to move somewhere. I want to do something for God. So here's the, here's the thing about Lord, is that if we would simply believe God, just simply believe God for Goliath. If we will simply believe God for the worst trouble, that sounds kind of contradictory, don't it? If we would believe God for the worst mountain, the rockiest road, he'll not just give us the road and the mountain and the Philistine. 
He'll give us everything else that comes with it once it's slain. But we've got to do something. We can't just sit and be complacent. We've got to dream bigger. We've got to think better. Oh, I don't feel equipped. I'm sure this nation did not feel equipped when Moses dies. And here you got a young man coming up named Joshua. And he's saying, oh, the Lord just passed the baton to me and now I'm leading you. And I'm sure he had some people in his ranks just thinking, who the heck do you think you are? I know who you are. I know your daddy. But here's the thing that you find with Joshua. He doesn't sit back and make excuse. He rises to the occasion. He rises to the occasion. And verse 1 says, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead, so now arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them and to the sons of Israel. See, tragedy can bring two things in our lives. Setback can bring two things in our lives. Struggles and troubles that we face in our life and our journey with journey with our, our life with Jesus can, can bring us into two different ways. It can either pull us down or it can motivate us to change. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go back to where it was. I, I know what got me there. I know what got me into that thinking. I know what got me into that lifestyle. I know what got me into those bad relationships. I know what got me into all that mess that I was journeying through and walked through and everything else. And I don't want to go back there. So what does that mean? That means that when I face trouble, when I'm in the promised land and I'm facing trouble, I need to let trouble motivate me to change. Why? So that way I know how to take down the Philistine. That way I know how to speak to that mountain that be removed. So that way I can talk to the addiction that keeps trying to come back to my head. So that way I can talk to the, the lust or the junk or whatever that's going on in my life. I can talk to it and speak to it and say, you don't belong here no more. That was me back then, but it ain't me now. We got to let things that prick us and things that hurt us and things that cut us create a tenacity inside of us to cause us to rise up to the occasion and say, come on, let's do this. Get some backbone. Exactly right, Betty. I'm tired of living in a world of, especially men. Let's, let me talk to men for a minute. I'm sick of living in a world of men they cower behind excuse. Where's the men with backbone, with no excuse, with integrity? Men of their word. Men that say that if I want to do something, they follow through with it and do it. Men who aren't afraid to work 12, 14 hours a day if that's what it takes to put bread on the table for their family. Men that won't sit at home and be lazy. Where, where's the men that will be men of integrity, men that will rise up and do what they know that they need to do to be morally right in their home and raise their kids right? Where's these men at? It's time to rise up. Maybe we've been quiet because we've been smoked out by all the nonsense of this world and all the crazy that goes on around us, but I'm telling you what, it's time that we rise up and let the world know we ain't like you. We're better than that mess. We're better than that mess. And I'm tired of living in a world of pansies. I said it. We need people with backbone. Backbone. But he rises to this occasion. He rises to the occasion. And I'm telling you right now, it's time to arise. It's time to quit looking at what was. It's time to quit settling for what is. 
and p- p- start pursuing for what he wants us to have. I believe, you know, when the Lord was speaking to me this morning, I believe it more than anything. I, I do believe that we're in a transition, and we're in an important transition right now. Because some of us has walked through some things, and God has brought us through some healing, and God has brought us through just, oh man, the things that the Lord has done in the last six months is crazy. He's exposed some things. He's, I mean, it's just been nuts. It's been amazing. But it's been trouble. But I tell you what, it's been a blessing. It's been a huge blessing. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you've gone through that journey. But in this transition, we do one of two things. We get complacent or we step up to and say, where's the next town? Where's the next city? Where's the next barrier? Where's the next wall? Where's the next thing that I need to battle? Because I know I'm not done yet. The enemy would like to trick you into the idea you're finished. You've arrived. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I have not arrived. I've been in this since October 1989. And I look at the journey that's ahead, and I'm like, God, do I ever get there? (laughs) Do I ever get there? That's the thing about the Lord. When it's an eternal relationship, you never get there. So just to find peace in the fact, this will not get finished. I know for us that like to finish things, that's hard. (laughs) <laughs> why is it hard because we like to have finished things we like to know there's a finality or final however you say that word yes we like to know we accomplished it we've arrived the thing is is when you're in an eternal relationship you never arrived it's never finished it's ongoing forever but the enemy would like to think that, okay, you went through this journey, you got to the other side, and now it's okay, and now you're, you've arrived, you've, you've worked it out. This is why the New Testament tells us, be careful lest we think we're strong because we might just fall. Hmm. What's, he, what's he warning us? He's warning you that when you think you've arrived and you've got it, be careful because the enemy is trying to get you to trip up on the next step. And you got to be careful. But we need to arise to the occasion. Here's a, th- here's a thing, a couple things real quick about Joshua here that we learn that is really, really, really powerful in this passage of Scripture. Verse 3, I love this. Because as we're going through this journey with him and as we're walking into this promised land and we're taking this next step, listen to what, listen to what the Lord told Joshua. Every place on which, the verse 3, Every place on which the sole of your footsteps, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. What does that mean? That means every time that I take a step of faith that God has ordered, he's already given it to me. He's already given it to you. Oh, I'm praying for a new job. God's already given it to you. Oh, I'm praying. God's already given it to you. See, here's the beautiful thing is is all the promises in God are yes and amen. They're not maybe. They're not tomorrow. They're not next week. Although sometimes it takes a while. But in God's eternal time, he didn't know that. He has no concept of time like we do. (laughs) Time don't affect him. That's no insult to God. That's an insult to us because we're trapped with time, and he's not. Because he's got this big picture in mind, right? But he orders our steps. And because he orders our steps, we can trust the path. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. There's a verse, there's a translation in, in Psalm 37 and 23 that says it this way, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in God's way. 
I like that. That's pretty good. Proverbs 16.9, the mind of a person plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Let me throw this out there. He cannot order your steps if you've not given him permission to be Lord of every, per- every piece of your life. He can't order your steps if you're not given him permission to be Lord of every area of your life. But here's the beauty of it. When we do, we can trust him with the path because he will order the steps. What's the next step? I don't know. He does. But when he says it, I'm going to step into it. Why? Because when he gives me a step, that means he's already given it to me. All he's asking me to do is be obedient. He's not asking me to do anything but be obedient. That's it. He does the rest. And it's amazing how he does it. Here's the other thing. Verse 4 of chapter 1. The Lord envisions us with more than what we can imagine. See, God took Joshua back up to that hill where Moses saw the promised land. And he envisioned it, Joshua. He said, Joshua, it's not good enough just to cross the Jordan. You see the first city? Eh, that ain't nothing. You see the third city, the fourth city? Fit that ain't nothing. He said, I have something bigger than all that. What I have for you is more than what your eyes can see. And he tells him in verse 4, he says, from the wilderness and this Lebanon. Now, I want you to understand something. He tells him every place in verse 3, every place on which the sole of your footstep, your footsteps, I have given it to you just as I've spoken to Moses. In verse 4, from what? From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. What is he telling him? He's saying, I'm giving you the world. You want to settle for the banks of Jordan, and you want to settle for conquering the first city. You want to settle for winning the first battle, but I'm wanting to give you the world. And if you will trust me with the steps, you trust me with the steps along the path, I'm telling you right now, you will gain the world. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I want the world. I don't want just St. Joseph. I don't want just Stewartsville. I don't want just Rushville. I don't want just Fawcett. I don't want just Savannah. I, I want the world. Jesus came for the world. He didn't come for your city. You mean he doesn't care for my city? He cares about the world. Can you encompass the world? Mm. Some people have struggled with that. That's all right. God will show you. Ephesians 3, 20, 20 says this. Now that him who is able to do more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus all generations forever and ever. Amen. Think about that. Him who is able to do more abundantly than what we can ask or think. Think. Here's the thing. According to the power that works within us. Hmm? What power is he talking about? He's talking about Holy Spirit. (laughs) He's talking about good old Holy Spirit that he promised the church. That's who he's talking about. He works in you to do what? To gain what you can't even ask. To gain what you can't even imagine. To gain what you can't even think about. To gain the world. He works in you for that purpose. He works in you that when you take a step of faith and obedience, it's done. He didn't say it wouldn't be a struggle. He didn't say it wouldn't have trouble. He didn't say that it wouldn't that it'd be easy. He just said that when you take the step of faith, it would be done. 
The problem is, is we see trouble and we think, oh, that must not be God. Oh, well, that wasn't very peaceful. Oh, I'm praying for the peace of God to guide me. The peace of God was never an indicator whether he was in his will or not. Tell that to the Christians right now that are giving their lives around the world. Tell them it was peaceful when they got their head cut off. Tell them it was peaceful when they saw their kids die. Tell them that it was peaceful and that was the will of God. wasn't the will of God. You missed it. You tell that to the martyr. Peace is not an indicator whether you're in the will of God or not. Peace through it does. See, the difference between the idea of peace being meaning I have peace because there's no trouble and peace because I'm at rest with inside. There's a difference. God promises rest with inside, peace with inside. We, we, we get this mixed up. I don't even know where the church erred into this thinking that I got to have peace. That it's just got to work smoothly. It's just got to fit together for it to be in the will of God. I don't know where the church came up with that crazy idea. I, I really don't. Because some things that's in God's will makes absolutely no sense, and it comes with all kinds of briars and thorns and thickets and all kinds of stuff, and you get in a place sometimes you're in God's will, you get cut up so much, you're like, God, when are you going to quit cutting me? Because it hurts. Some of the abscess of life, you know, the infection, Infections that are in our skin are so deep, it sometimes it takes a deep cut to get the infection out. And sometimes when we're in the will of God and we're in this journey and we're taking the promised land and we've risen to the occasion, we're like, yes, God, and we get all excited and we're running toward the promise. And God says, okay, I tell you what, you, you, you want that new job? I tell you what you need to do. You need to put an extra $10 in the offering plate this week. Like, oh, God, I can't do that. Mm -mm. Or you'll be praying, oh, God, you know, I believe in God that you're going to bring bring salvation to my friend and everything else. And, man, I'm telling you, God, I'm just excited because I know your word says that, 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 that it's not your will that any should perish. And I'm just believing, God, that Holy Spirit's going to bring a divine appointment. And all of a sudden, God tells you, you need a witness to your friend. Like, I don't want to ruin my relationship. you're more concerned about your relationship with them than you are their souls going to hell or not. Which, which is more selfish here? The eternal or the temporal? But he orders our steps. He envisions us for the world. Here's a statement that you find that you hear echoed throughout this chapter over and over and over again. And this is a hard one for some of us. Be strong and be courageous. It's repeated over and over. But here's what, here's what I love about verse 5. It says, no one will be able to oppose you all the days of your life. What? Wait a minute. Did you not hear what they said about us? Hope some of y'all got your ear to the floor when it comes to the community talking about us. I love what's being said. It makes me laugh, too, because you know what? When they're mocking and they're talking, you know what? I'm as happy because that just means they're jealous. They don't have something that we got, and they don't know how to get it. And I'll tell you what. You come to the gate, I'll show you how. Um, Oops, <laughs> oops. <laughs> rabbit, shroom. it's not rabbit season yet. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but he says in verse 5, no one will be able to oppose you all the days of your life. And I'm going to tell you what, from the beginning of this church plant has been nothing but opposition. It has. 
It has been one thing after another that has happened. And I remember, I remember the first day we started, I said, I looked at everybody, I said, okay, see everybody standing here? I guarantee a year from now, over half of you will not be here. And over half of you are not here. I said, give it another six months after that, there'll be another one. I said, got to bring in new people. New people will start coming and things will start happening. But watch these transitions. Then you got, you know, COVID that happens. I mean, you can't get even get any greater opposition than the government shutting you down saying you can't have church. Right? When you try to do a church plant and you're only three years old. That's right. That's right. Three months, sorry. Oh, mercy. I was wrong on that one. But in three months, and then we're shut down. And then we get, then we, then we go to going outside for a little while. Then we end up going to a food kitchen that echoed so bad in that place. We're like, okay, then am I hearing myself ten times? And then you turn the air on, it feels like you turn the heat on. You turn the heat on, it felt like you turn the air on. It's like, oh, this is miserable. And then we have our first service here, and I ended up smoking everybody out because I didn't know anything about the furnace thing with the fire. We had to open a garage door. <laughs> yeah, we had a house fire, and the Lord was here. It was a mess. You know, then we had we had trouble getting our tags with a trailer for whatever, getting a title. We had, I mean, there was just things that have gone on. People getting mad, walking off, and just, I mean, just some crazy stuff. Opposition will happen. If you're not, if you're not getting opposition, you need to ask yourself if you're really walking in the promise. Because the promise will always bring opposition. Always. Always. And you have to ask yourself, what, what, what's coming against me? Because if, if I'm walking in the promise and I'm taking that next step, I can't see that next step as though there's not opposition. If I see opposition, I need to ask myself, is that God's will? Because as the old, as the, as the old phrase says, if I say this right, Normally, the road less taken is the one with the most obstacles. Yet the one with the most obstacles has the greatest reward. I want the reward. <laughs> you know, when I used to coach soccer, they told us, you know, well, you can't keep score. I said, you watch. <laughs> you watch. So every Saturday we play a game of soccer. These kids would come over, the parents come over. All right, coach, what was the score? We lost today. Jamie did this. Mark did that. We need to work on this part. Well, coach, I'm glad you're a coach and not just a fan chair on the side, just fanning the kids down the field. I said, I'm serious about this. I said, you can't train up kids to play soccer if you're not training them right and getting on to them and disciplining them when they're doing wrong so you can teach them the right way to win. Win. Don't even know where I was going with that. But anyway. <laughs> True words. Yep. You will find that opposition. Here's the promise, though. Verse 5, just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not desert you nor abandon you. Verse 9, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What is he trying to get to us? Again, here God's repeating himself. He's saying, I'm giving you the promised land. He's saying, you're, I'm going to order your steps. He's saying you're going to face opposition, but be strong and courageous because no one will be able to oppose you. 
and they will not be able to oppose you, and I'm not going to desert you. I'm not going to abandon you. And I love what Isaiah 54, 17 says. No weapon that is formed against you will succeed, and you will condemn every tongue that accuses you in judgment. That is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication of mine. What does that tell me? It tells me that if I'm walking in the aligned steps to the promise that God has given me in my life, and opposition comes against me, oh, I tell you what, you coming after me, I'm a child of God. That's what we need to do. See, we, we see opposition, and we think we got a strong man in it. Why we need a strong man when all we got to do is take our little finger and flick it away like a little cricket on a table somewhere? Just, I don't want that bug on my table. It's my table. You own the house. You own the journey. You own the promise because he's given it to you and you're a child of God. What makes you think that they have a right to oppose you? What do you think they have a right to cause you trouble? They don't. But when they do, you need to take courage and know that when they try to oppose you, what, what, what does he mean nobody will oppose me? Because, you know, people come against us, right? God, you know, God, people come against me. What does that mean not to oppose you? What that means is they will not defeat you. It doesn't mean you won't have a fight. It doesn't mean you won't have a conflict. It means they won't defeat you. And to me, that's encouraging. Because when I see trouble and I see opposition and I'm walking in the promises of God and I'm going from, from the banks of, Jer of Jordan to the next city or to the next place that God wants me to be, I know that whatever comes against me will not succeed. Oh, it'll come against me. Oh, they'll talk about us. Oh, they'll, they'll do all kinds of crazy out here doing stupid. I tell you, that's what exactly what's going to happen. But I'm telling you now that when all that chaos and shenanigans and junk goes on, it will not win unless you let it. It won't win. He will not desert you. He will not abandon you. You've got to be strong and courageous. Matter of fact, in just this chapter, three times, three times, God tells them, be strong and courageous. Why, why does he tell them three times to be strong and courageous? Because God knows that the opposite of faith is fear. And when you take a promise of God and, you, and, it, and it's a step of faith, <laughs> it's a step of faith. There's no question about it. When you don't know what the step looks like and you're not sure what the end result is yet because God's on this eternal clock thing and we're not, and so... He's ordered our step, not our path, our step. You know why I think he orders our steps on the path? Because he knows the path can change. Did you catch that? God orders our steps because he knows the path can change. Why? Because life happens. Situations happen. How, how, how do you, how, how, how does that even make sense? It makes sense like this. When Moses got them out of Egypt, they were to go to the promised land. The path changed because of sin. But that doesn't mean God didn't continue to order their steps. He did. Let them in circle for 40 years, but nevertheless, he ordered their steps. God's going to order your steps. Next thing is he will cause you to prosper. Verse 7, be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may achieve success wherever you go. Here's the thing that I want you to completely and totally understand. Promises have conditions. We live in an entitlement idea that we think God owes us something. God owes you nothing. But if you want from him, there's a condition. You mean I have to earn it? You don't earn salvation. 
But if you want to walk in promise, there's conditions. You're saying, how's that so, Lil? John 15, 7 is a powerful verse of Scripture. Underline it, remember it, pray it, believe it, live it. If you remain in me. Oh, wow, wait a minute. I thought I was always in God. Well, then you explain to me why the Bible has the word if. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What's the condition? Live the life. Don't just talk it. Walk it. There's condition. Oh, why hasn't God come through yet? Well, are you just talking it or are you walking it? We have to ask ourselves that question. He wants to prosper you. He wants to take you into the promise. The second one, the first one is you must obey the scriptures. The second one is we must study the scriptures. Verse 8 says this, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to what is written in it. So what lights our steps? Well, the Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 2 Timothy 2.15, I'm going to say this, and I want you to just catch this. Nowhere in the Bible does the Bible say, read the Bible. What do you mean these preachers have been lying to me all these years? I need to go home and read my Bible? It's not in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to read the Bible. I'll tell you what it says, and this is what we'll start right here, 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. See, we, we need to obey the scriptures, but we can't obey what we don't know. And then we wonder why we don't get the promise. The, the promise comes with conditions, but if we don't know the conditions, how are we supposed to get the promise? There's something we're, not, we're lacking here, and it's called knowledge. It's called understanding, and this is how you get it. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. Oh, I want to be approved by God, don't you? As a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Oh, God has put my head high for me. Accurately handling the word of truth. Some verses, some versions say, and study to show yourself approved. We are not supposed to read the Bible. We're supposed to study the Bible. We're supposed to put it on our doorpost, put it in our, our put little, little sticky notes on our <laughs> mirrors. We're supposed to memorize it. We're supposed to put it in here so that it comes out here. The problem is, is we don't live it out here because we don't put it here. We don't put it here because we're not in it. And then when we're in it, we just want to read it and we don't want to study it. And I want to encourage you today, study it. There's a reason why it's not working in your life. There's a reason why you, you, you're sitting on the banks of the Jordan River with your feet. Oh, you're on the other side. You're, you're in the area of promise, but you've not gotten the promise. And you've not gotten the promise because you've not met the conditions yet. And you've not met the conditions yet because you don't know what the Word says. And you don't know what the Word says because you think just reading it works when you need to get in here and study it. You need to meditate on it. You need to pray on it. You need to ask God to show you the answers to the questions that you've got in your life as to why I am where I am and how I need to get out. It's interesting. That God did not tell Joshua, go make spears. God did not tell Joshua, go make helmets. God didn't tell Joshua, go make shields. All that stuff happens later. But at first, God does not tell him that. What's the first thing God tells him? He tells him, get in the word. Study it. Understand it. Apply it to your life. There's conditions to the promises that I've given you. And I want to give you the promise. But you've got to meet the conditions. 
Too many people think just because they're saved, they've got all the promises. No, just because you're saved, you have access to the promise. But access means there's a key to unlock something. And too many people stand at the door when God's already given the key found in the word of God and they will not meet the conditions because they don't want to. And then they wonder why it didn't happen for them. It didn't happen for you because you're not willing to pay the cost to get it to happen. Every time trouble comes up, you want to hide. Every time struggles come up, you want to move to the side. Every time something uh, oppressive comes toward your way, you think, oh, that's not God. That doesn't have peace. I don't know about you, but I want the promise. I want the promise that we're the light on the hill that lights up the world. I want the promise that we were called into all the world. I want the promise that the Holy Spirit's poured out and we see revival in this area. I want the promise that the end times, the power of anointing of the Holy Spirit moving and knocking walls down where religious people come knocking at our doors mad. I want to make religious people mad. I want to be like Jesus. Jesus was a spiritual troublemaker. It's exactly right. We need a spiritual troublemaker. Did you ever see what he did with those tables when they were sitting there selling all those doves and stuff in a house of prayer? He didn't go in there and say, can you please move that table out of my way? That's not what Jesus did. Get the table out of here. That's what he did. Now it's broke. <laughs> But that's what he did. He didn't sit back with some cowardly bone in the spine saying, oh, I got to be nice to these people. I don't want to offend them. It's not what Jesus did. And when we see that opposition coming against us and we see that stuff opposing us, we need to look at it in the face and realize, okay, you're not standing in the way of the promise. It ain't happening. God said I can have this peace in my life. God said I can have joy in my life. I can have freedom in my life. I can have victory in my life. I can have everything I need in my life here and now and in a time to come. I don't even have to wait for this thing. It's right here, right now. But we've got to quit talking to the thing like, oh, will you just move out of my way? I don't want to offend you. And start getting a backbone and say, get out of here. It's mine. What are you doing standing in my way? You don't even belong here. I tell you what, if a thief came into my house, I'm going to grab my rifle. How many thieves have you allowed in your spiritual journey with God and you just put up with it? Go grab your spiritual rifle and take authority of your house. Take authority of your journey. Take authority of the things of God. Take authority of the promises that God's called you to in your life and get to know what the conditions are and start living it out and start walking it out and saying, this is mine. This is mine. Be like that little two-year-old. Mine, 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 mine. <laughs> It is yours. Give me some people with backbone. Get off that bank. Get off that bank. Quit watering around in this and get moving. Yeah, he's got me through the last 40 years. You saw manna come down. You saw quail come from nowhere. You saw the Jordan open up, and it was a miracle that got you into the promise. But just because you have access now doesn't mean you're living it. It's time we live this thing out. He said he's going to prosper us. Does that mean we're going to be rich? That ain't what he said. Matter of fact, 
John said, I wish that you would prosper even as your soul prospers. Actually, it says prosper and be in good health. Even as your soul prospers. We've been learning on Thursday night what that word soul means. It means emotions. God wants all of you. Maybe you ain't prospering because you're holding on to junk. You're not letting it go. Maybe you're not moving forward in the promise because you still got what happened yesterday on your mind when the person that offended you don't even remember it anymore. But you've locked your own self up into this emotional junk that's keeping you from what God wants you to have. You've got some choices tonight. He ain't called you to sit back. He's called you to be a warrior. And the makings of a warrior, tell you what, it's a little different than what we think. How do I find rest and peace in all of this? Because you don't do all you do is say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I like one on one of the, I believe it's Psalm 18. It says, my God will cause me to leap over a wall. Or leap through a troop and jump over a wall. My God will cause me to do this. What's that telling me? It's telling me nothing that stands against me is going to conquer me. Oh, it'll try to intimidate me. It'll try to ruffle my feathers. It'll try to get me sidetracked and set back. But it's not going to defeat you. It's there to help you. It's helped you get back home. you to grow to lead you to the next promise be thankful when you're serving Jesus you got stuff coming against you uh be thankful because that means you're not wandering around in a desert somewhere I don't know about you. I don't want to wander around in no desert. Mm-mm. I hear stuff and I'm like, God, bring it on. <laughs> they mock Jesus. I'm glad to be mocked. Religious people are mad at Jesus. I'm glad religious people are mad at me. Something's got to be doing something right. But I tell you what, it won't defeat us. It won't hold us down. It won't drown us. We might smell like smoke when we come out of the fire, but I tell you what, we won't be burned. It might be a little wet when we come up out of that flood, but we won't be drowned. Goliath might be 10 feet taller than us, but we're the one that walks away with the head. Now, that's awesome stuff. And here's the thing I love about it. Is David that day when he went to go take Goliath because he got sick of the enemy trying to taunt Israel and telling them they were worthless, didn't mean nothing, that they were just beast, just a bunch of weakling junks that they couldn't mount up to the hill of beans. David thought that day when he went to take Goliath that all he was doing was killing one man. That all he was doing was taking out one giant. Little did he know 
that the opposition of nine feet that stood in front of him, a little 16-year-old boy, little did he know that cutting the head of that giant off gave him the giant and gave him the Philistines and all the other surrounding cities around them that was trying to oppose and oppress and keep Israel in trap. God, give me the Goliath so I can have the nations. Give me the Goliath so we can have St. Joe. Give me the Goliath that we can have Rushville and Stewartsville and Fawcett and we can have Savannah and we can have all the Cameron, all the other areas that are around us. Give us the giant so we can cut its head off in the power and in the name of Jesus so that we can have the nations. Promise is the nations. The nations. Every ethnic group, every child, every woman, every boy, every girl. When we go riding down a road, that person that's standing on a corner and acting a fool, that's ours. That's that's the gates. That's that that's the promise. Go talk to the promise. See if they want to come on Sunday. Sometimes we're so busy, caught up in our own thing, we drive right past the promise. We're at a grocery store and someone gets an attitude with us, or we're in a restaurant and someone gives us some bad service because they have had a bad day. We give them a bad tip, just making their day even worse, instead of realizing that's That's our promise. Are we going to go get the promise and say, hey, you know what? I know you're having a bad day. I don't know what your financial need is. I know my meal only costs $10, but I'm going to give you a $20 tip. I guarantee they're going to ask who you are and what you're from. Now you've got a key to access the promise. You say, you know what? I'm a child of God. I know you're having a bad day. You know, it's okay. Can I pray with you? We got to take it back. 